Hey, hi, and welcome back, everybody, to episode 113 of the Dan John University.com podcast. It's good to be back, and uh, we have a good uh, variety of questions this week. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Uh, as you know, if you go to the YouTube uh, channel, uh, we have well over 2,000 videos now. Uh, that's a lot of videos, and uh, I, I don't know how to help you find specific things. Uh, there is a nice little search engine, which many people just don't seem to know how to use, but it's always up there. Uh, we have Olympic lifting, kettlebells, all kinds of fun things up there for you to share and enjoy. Over at danjohnuniversity.com, I'll be coming out with a new course here about a week or so on uh, the easy strength for fat loss. Uh, follows up a lot of the work I've been doing for the last almost an entire year now. In my own case, I went from 251 pounds to 218 pounds. And my goal is to lose a few more. I want to get down to 96 kilos so I can lift in that class. Um, I can't believe how, in some cases, how kind of easy it was. Easy when you talk about dieting is always like a, you have to have an asterisk and then a, a little point in the bottom, a footnote in the bottom. But, uh, you know, fairly painlessly, and I'm happy to report that. Uh, we have lots of courses on the site now. Uh, there's two on easy strength, which uh, are very popular. One on programming that, by the way, is the most popular of all, which I, w I found interesting. And then one on goal setting, which is something that I, 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 when I do my certs and things like that, I'll talk a lot about goal setting with the people. And it's interesting because when you're talking with people who are getting their Russian kettlebell cert certificate, they're a different uh, breed of cat than 99% uh, of the population. So... I have to teach those students how to deal with the rest of society. And, the, and there's that goal setting course deals with both the active athlete, which is anybody who has a you know physical goal, really. And then the rest of the population that has these kind of vague goals. Um, I, I think there's value to it. I think there's value to learning about the phrases goal setting before you get started. Um, really proud of the university. It's going well. Uh, the forum's wonderful. Someone said on one of the comments in one of my YouTube videos that I talk about the workout generator too much. And I thought to myself, actually, I don't think I talk about it enough. I think it's the answer to many people's issues. Um, it is, uh, it's based on years and years and years of experience and research and advice from some of the finest people in the world. And then Brian just knitted it together into this really seamless little thing. So Dan John University, uh, stop by and visit. Okay, thank you. Let's begin episode 113 with a question from Paul. And he asked me, what are your thoughts on the behind the neck press or, or the behind the neck pull-ups? I guess uh, you die if you do the behind the neck press. But when I was young, uh, I was, that's hyperbole. Uh, but when I was young, the behind neck press was, was a pretty common thing. But it's interesting because I think people screw it up. Uh, one thing like Dick Notmeyer really emphasized, is that when you brought the weight down, you never brought it behind your hairline. You know, this, that little line right there. Now, if you're, you know, if you have really long hair, like you're a member of the Do Doobie Brothers or ZZ Top, the hairline is still that line right there where the hair grows, unless you're like me and you have a hairy back. But, you know, the idea was we would press down to about here. Uh, really, you'll notice that my arms are almost, uh, perpendicular to the floor they're still vertical and we press back up you know i never had issues uh doing that the behind the neck pull up of course was something the bodybuilders did um i don't see a lot of use for it if you're like a if you're in any kind of collision you know i mean if you're a <laughs> i don't know if you're a green beret or something doing behind neck pull-ups i just don't how often you have to pull yourself to there right? usually you want to get yourself up and over you know, one of the advice I have for, for any special forces, SWAT teams, is that the gym have, uh, especially here in the United States, uh, chain link fences to practice climbing up and leaping over because that's going to be much more common. Uh, fire escapes, maybe. Uh, uh, walls of various heights, wooden wooden walls, and learn how to get over those because getting over walls is radically different than putting the back of your head onto it. I think they're fine. I, I've read that and people have been to workshops and people say how horrible they are. But, you know, people did them for a long time and, and didn't seem to me to have a lot of shoulder issues. But um, 
the, I mean, I'm, I'm already out of my pay grade here, but I, I think, you know, I mean, if, if you have any kind of shoulder issue, I, I would, I would still probably just do kettlebell presses. From my experience, the kettlebell press, both the single and the doubles seem to be the, the safest, uh, shoulder push exercises I know. And then the suspension trainer work like the T Y the row, and then the marvelous exercise, the single arm row, uh, are the best for the, for the shoulders. I mean, if, if all you did was, you know, I mean, I, 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 I love hyperbole. And I said at a recent workshop, you know, you have to, you, you pick a, you, you pick a hip thrust, you pick a front squat, or you pick a, a deadlift. And that's part one of your workout. And part two of the workout is half kneeling presses with the kettlebell and then uh, uh the the suspension trainer work and that's all you need i said you know chris that's you know you always say that kind of stuff when you when you're in a workshop um yeah I, I i can understand why people are hesitant to do it but at the same time you know your mileage it's your mileage may vary um so paul those are my thoughts i don't know how well i answered the question but thank you we have a question from muhammad in your opinion, what's the best way to breathe during the performance of the snatch and the clean and jerk? Well, I don't know if it's my opinion. This is the way I was taught, but you know, as I as I grab the bar, you know, I, I hook my hand, I hook my thumbs on, and I and I and I roll myself in, and, and just before I do my lift, I take that big and and I hold that breath as for the snatch, and I'll probably let a little bit out as it comes up, but you certainly don't want to go <sighs> with the weight overhead. Now in the clean and jerk, you have to be a little careful because after a tough clean, man, you, 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 you know, I've stood up on the platform and breathed up there, <gasps> uh, caught my breath, but really on the clean, it's still going to be a, <sighs> as you stand up <sighs> and then when you jerk, it should be, <sighs> You know, uh, that's the breathing. So it's all that tight at the workshops. I call it T S S S S S T breathing, tss, tss, breathing. Um, you don't want to let a lot of air out. You, I think you probably could hold your breath. It's just not the way I was taught. And, and, I, and I tell you, and my concern on the clean and jerk is, you know, you, I have passed out on clean and jerks when it, it catches right out here and it knocks you out. Uh, getting knocked out in a clean is, is it's funny to look at, but it's really quite dangerous, you know, for your audience members, uh, for yourself and, and the people in the front row. Well, that's how I teach Muhammad, and that's how I do it. Thank you. We have a question from Jacob. It's the longest question. Um, you know, I won't even do the context. Uh, Jacob is in the uh, United States Army, and the, he... F there's a sense that they're, they're not organizing things very well at all. And I, and I, and I understand that it, it um, he's a, he's in a, he's on a, he's on a, he's in a group, a smallish group, and they're supposed to be getting ready for this test, but they don't feel like they're doing a very good job. So from six 30 to seven 30 every day, they have PT session given this slot each day. What would, what I ideal week be? Well, you know, I mean, it's pretty simple. I still think, I always think there's value uh, for the for the military in a weekly long run. And I got to tell you, uh, I I mean, just show up and do like a more like that Swedish word fart lick. You know, maybe you get there at 630. You start off with a walk. You maybe you uh, maybe do it like a parkour, P-A-R course, where you maybe you, you, you throw in uh, randomly for the first 15 minutes uh you know, a pull up, a, 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 a V up on the ground, a, um, squat thrust, which some people call burpees. You know, it could be something like that. It could be step ups on, on benches. It could be just something. And then, you know, increase the run. Maybe every time you come to a hill, you sprint up the hill uh, on flats. Maybe you have, maybe one of you just, you know, blows a whistle, you know, randomly. And, and when the whistle blows, you go hard. And then when the whistle blows, you stop, throw in some walking sessions, um, just go, you know, have a one hour run and mix walking, sprinting, uh, running. I'm not a big fan of that. 
if you've seen someone jog, not that. I want you to run uh, for about that hour. And we're not necessarily trying to kill ourselves in this, but have, have a long run that's mixed with things. Okay, so that's one day a week. One day a week, I'd love to have you guys do what we call a tonic day. That would be an hour of mobility, flexibility. Um, and I know the military doesn't support this kind of thing. This might be the good day because it is kind of a, you know, you, you, maybe that would be the tonic day. Maybe you maybe you still should have a warm up, but really focus maybe on the throwing events and the PT test, and maybe like a farmer walk loaded carry. So yeah, so you you show up, you play with the medicine balls for, you know, uh, there's there's a we have a game called Ultimate, where we play Ultimate Frisbee, but we play it with medicine balls. Uh, same rules, it's hilarious. Uh, if you have a four pound Dynamax ball, that's the only one, that's the one I recommend the most. It's the safest, but you could probably do anything and it, it involves a lot of throwing and running and laughing and it's a, it's a great warm up. Hell, do that for half an hour. Uh, but then if, if you went for 15 minutes of just basic throwing, uh, from the chest overhead, uh, feet together, left foot forward, right foot forward, do all the variations you can overhead tosses uh, again if you want to do feet together left foot forward right foot forward you do get a little bit a little bit of that rotation i'm not a huge fan of a ton of rotation in medicine ball throwing obviously there's need for some of it but that'd be individual according to what you would need and then maybe uh you know you do a i mean a few rounds of i go you go uh, farmer walks and then hop on the ground and do your uh, uh, mobility, your original strength, your flexibility work or whatever, and call it a day. So the one long run day with the variations in it, uh, the one the one day with the med ball work and the uh, uh, loaded carries with mobility, and then the other three days, I would try to set up some kind of traditional program. You know, I hate to say the workout generator, but, uh, you know, you could do worse than that, but... I'd love to see you guys lift weights. I would always recommend with the military a vertical press, a vertical pull because of the pull-up test. Um, I would love to see a squat variation in there. I'd love to see a hinge variation in there. And, I mean, for you guys, suitcase carries uh, three days a week would not be over the top. Uh, week one, maybe, you know, you could do three sets of eight. Week one, week two, three sets of ten. Week three, three sets of twelve. Uh, slide down to five sets of three, then three sets of five, and then five sets of five. There's a good six week, uh, there you go. Uh, six weeks of military, yeah. three sets of eight military. It's going to do some good things for hypertrophy. Uh, three sets of eight, three sets of 10, three sets of 12. That's good for hypertrophy. And then you'd uh, increase the load the next couple of weeks. And then that hard five by five. You, on the five by five week, you might only get the lifts in, but that's okay because you sped up on the other days. And then on those three days, I would pick one of your new events and practice the event. So um, you could do, you know, I mean, so today is push-up practice day. Don't just test it. Um, you know, you could do something. I mean, uh, think of it as a track practice, you know, do like in the push-up test, uh, you know, do a couple rounds of 15 seconds, maybe four times 15 seconds. Uh, and, and try to go fast on those push-ups. Um, the next week, do three rounds of 30 seconds um, and then play around with even a more extended period, <laughs> which, and on the pull-ups, you know, if your best is 10 pull-ups have a day where you do, I don't know, uh, 10 sets of two or 10 sets of three or something like that. Some, so a lot of volume with very, very low intensity. So you can come back and keep doing it. So one long run day with a lot of variation, with some calisthenics in it, with some sprinting, with some walking. One day of the med ball work, loaded carry, and then the tonic stuff. And then three days of traditional weightlifting, but practice the tests. The nice thing about your new tests, the new tests are, to me, much more logical. And the, the actual practicing of the tests is going to be good for you in every endeavor you look at. One of my friends is, is a Green Beret. And when I did the workshop in, well, it was either Seattle, Hawaii, or Okinawa, one of the three, he came up after and he showed me all these pictures of them in the field, actual deployment pictures. And he said, I don't know why we do all these pull-ups, because we're all we ever do in, in, in the real world is loaded carries. And I thought that was kind of funny. 
uh, the thing they'd never done is, what is their job title? It'd be like being an American football coach and never practicing ball control, tackling and, and blocking, which of course is the core of the game, or being a discus thrower and never doing full turn. I, I hope that helps, Jacob. Um, you, If you want more, you contact me and, I'll, and we'll have a phone call. Okay, thanks. We have a question from Pete. Um, we've actually had a similar question before, so this might be a repeat. <laughs> so, post being locked down, I've moved from killing myself in the gym alone for an hour four times a week to actually doing activities with other humans, running, swimming, climbing, etc. And now, instead, split my up my other stuff throughout the day. Whenever the opportunity arises, I do work from home. Yeah, I like that. That's, I, I already like where you're heading. I agree. As an example, 15 minutes of crawling and rolling in the morning, walk the dog with my daughter and the baby carrier for a mile or so. This is a good day already. And some pull-ups while the kids eat their breakfast, balance on a beam during a long meeting, throw around some bells before lunch. I no longer really count sets or reps or get really worried about leg days, but reckon I accumulate lots more work during each day than before. Any tips or tricks? Will a non-athlete miss out on anything with this approach? No. In fact, I think it's repeatable. It's doable. I think it's really a good idea. Um, yeah, Pete, this is this is good stuff. I like it when things, uh, when training is seamless with your lifestyle. Uh, I think when I failed as an athlete, as as when I was a father, especially, is when I kept trying to train like I did when I was a college student versus adapting and moving on with the realities of life. Um, uh, I hope you've got your sleep, and I know it's tough with kids and a dog, but I hope you're working on your sleep, sleep hygiene. Um, you know, I don't want to, I usually don't tell people, but I, I use that hibernate, which uh, maybe I'll even, it's, it's going to be in my, I'll have a link for that in my Easy Strength uh, workshop, uh, Easy Strength for Fat Loss workshop. But if you go to the Dan John forum at davedraper.com, um, we talk about hibernate a lot. It's a magnesium supplement with just a, I mean, a tiny bit of melatonin, but it really helps me sleep. It's a, it's, it's kind of a multivitamin. I like it a lot. Uh, I wear this, this weird sleep mask that's over there when I sleep. Um, it's got Bluetooth speaker here and it's, uh, it's got, it goes all the way down like this. Oh, I'm a sight. Uh, and I and I use Brain.fm at night. Um, I mean, if you took if you took any kind of, I mean, I just be just just be careful about not overdoing it with the melatonin. But magnesium seems to help a lot of people sleep better at night. I, I, I worry about people overdosing on melatonin. I mean, you just need a hint of it, or or none. I mean, it. it, it but it. Um, but do your best, you know, don't don't watch TV about a half an hour to an hour before you go to bed. Uh, I have lights, and, you know, I have a, I've got these lights that I, and I, I found that reading books uh, really helps me. I like Lawrence Block's uh, The Burglar ser Series with Bernie Rodenbar at night. Uh, the chapters are short, and if I time it right, uh, often I'll kind of fall asleep, and I'll have, I'll, I'll still have the book on my chest. That's when I know I've nailed it perfectly. I don't know how long... So, oh, by the way, and I also have the books on uh, Audible because what I find is I, when I fall asleep, I don't remember what the hell's going on in the book. So uh, food-wise, I hope you're eating a lot of fiber, vegetables, uh, fermented foods, drinking your water, you know, doing those basic, simple things. And make sure you model that behavior for your kids because uh, that's really important too. Gosh, I hope that helped. And uh, I'm, I love it. And by the way, uh, other listeners, I hope you're paying attention. There's no reason you have to count reps. There's no reason. Uh, if you're getting the work in, you know. Uh, I remember one time uh, somebody came into the Pacific Barbo Club and asked Dick all these specific questions. And it would be like, you know, what is your volume? What is your intensity levels? And it's like, well, I have Dan. You know, he snatches until he can't make the lifts anymore. Then we lighten up and do a couple triples. Then we move on. Well, what is the, you know, he had all these fancy questions. And Dick was just, you know, just get the work in, you know, and that's. That's pretty good. Great question, and 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 I'm and I and I and I really kind of envy you in a bit because when you have a baby and a baby carries, you have a, you're gonna have a lot of fun in the future. All right, thank you. We have a question from Orion. 
In the past six months, I've started training for kettlebell sport with the goal of competing the 10 minute long cycle, which I consider one of the great feats of, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what the quality is because it's, it's strength, power, endurance, whatever you want to call it. Stamina, of course, that's from the root. Uh, it's funny because stamina and stamina's root and the word knit, knit, uh, pardon me, fit, as in uh, I'm fit to do a task, both come from the same basic root. It's uh, threads, knitting. Fit means to knit. To, and the best way to think of fit is a jigsaw puzzle. The pieces fit together, they knit. Um, so it's interesting because the long cycle is a, is a stamina fitness exercise. So you, you're going to knit yourself with double 16K. That's kind of light, but uh, let's read on. One area I'm struggling with is conditioning as I attempt longer duration sets closer to 10 minute goal. Well, I got a piece of advice from that one guy. He came out to Utah and I, I didn't, I don't know if, I wouldn't say we ever became friends or I don't even know if he likes me, but he did say one interesting thing, this great kettlebell guy uh, from Soviet, Soviet Union. And he said that it doesn't matter how light you have to go. You must practice the 10 minutes. So I wouldn't necessarily, you only need the 16s, but, you know, grab, grab two fours, uh, four kilo bells, four, four, and see if you can do the long cycle for 10 minutes. Because if you can't do it with four, there's no way you can do it with 16. And uh, one of the things we do to prepare people for the snatch test is we do, um, like if you're doing the, for the, kettlebell cert. If you're supposed to do the 24 for 100 reps, I'll start you out day one. We're going to just see, we'll give you the 12, half the weight, and see how long it takes to get to 100 reps. If you can't get to the 100 reps in five minutes with the 12, how are you supposed to magically do it with the 24? And then we build up to three sets of 100 uh, in one of the workouts. And for you, you just guessing at your numbers. Oh, okay. You're 36 year old, 90 kilo guy. So for you, I mean, I might have you do a workout where you do uh, maybe uh, the 16 for 100 reps, the 20 for 100 reps, and then maybe something as light as a 14 for the last round and really push the, the lungs issue of the, of the kettlebell snatch. Uh, the strength is easier. We can take care of that uh, in our other workouts in the week. But one of my thoughts might be is um, toss in once or twice a week. I, I don't mind twice a week on this idea where you do the 10 minute clean and uh, jerk cycle and maybe maybe you build yourself up to three rounds of 10 minutes. Man, if you can do that, you're a better man than I. That would be rough, but keep the weights ridiculously low and get used to getting to the 10 minute mark. And then from there, you'll have the conditioning built in so that you'll be able to slide up. You've it's like training an athlete for the 400 meters or the mile or the marathon. You know, you, you, the marathon's 26.2. You got to go all 26.2. You, you know, you don't run a marathon and say, you know, I, now I get it with the, like the ultra marathoners. They'll say, you know, I got this, I was doing a hundred mile run and I only got the 62 and my, my ankle froze. Okay. So I stopped and I get that. But if you're a 400 meter runner, you got to run the 400. You got to get a time on you at the 400 meters. And maybe the first week it's 70 seconds. But, you know, if we if we start knocking that down to 68, 64, 63, in the 50s, maybe one day in the 40s, maybe in the mid-40s, that's how we progress on this kind of thing. Uh, boy, Ryan, I hope that helped. Thank you. So uh, a question from Richard. My question is about what you would recommend as strength mobility exercises for a woman in her 70s with strength mobility exercises. Due to her suffering low back, hip and knee pain, injury, plus labyrinthitis, over the past few years, my mom has not been as active as she would like. She's in her mid-70s and recently had a fall oof, that she couldn't get up from. Fortunately, she did not suffer a severe injury, but it really spooked her, sure. She has uh, had various ailments checked over the last those years and has had physiotherapy, etc., I'm trying to work out if there's a basic set of exercises I could do with her over Zoom to dry, try to build back some strength, etc., so that she can get up off the ground next time and hopefully 
would be like less less likely to fall over. She's not overweight and she and assume she has no equipment. Well, I you know I would start with some basic simple things. Now this is a I'm already out of my pay grade, but I'm going to give you some advice. First off, I would start suggesting um, that she spend some time doing um, something as simple as march in place. Now, I think I don't think people appreciate march in place as much as you should. There's some things about marching in place that are good, especially if you slow down. So as you march in place with her and uh, play with loads, uh, not very much. Um, this is this is a goblet. OK, you could you could have a goblet over your head. You could have something standing here. You could have a suitcase carry. Um, I don't know if uh, they're called Clorox bottles or or, or handles, you know, you have her train with a bottle of uh, Jameson, you know, huh? holding that handle like it's a kettlebell and march in place and try to go slower to the point that it even becomes uh, that she stops from there we might even want to slide over into a gentle speed skater because this is where we begin okay this is where we begin that we need to make sure the feet uh, the feet and all the systems uh, that work on balance are working uh, something as simple as going right foot to left foot in that gentle speed skater might have some real value for you. Uh, I'd love to see you practice, have her practice actively getting up and getting down on the ground. So get on the ground, get back up, get on the ground, get back up. Uh, it's great for heart rate <laughs> and it's also good practice. Um, you might even want to experiment with standing on one foot and then do something as simple. So I'm standing on my, my left foot, I take my right hand and maybe First, I put it on my left hip, and then whew, we rest. Then I put it on my, my, my left quad, and then we rest. Then I put it on my, this one footed, okay, the right foot's up. Right knee, maybe the top of the socks, slide down if we can and see if we can build up some isometric strength in, in, uh, on one foot. Um, it would look like an airborne lunge, but w what we're trying to do is build up that stumble proofing. Um, if we can get her to hold on to a, a desk or a doorknob and uh, just do assisted squats, I think that would be money. And then from there, any kind of overhead pressing we can get her to do, any kind of pressing. So march in place, the speed skater thing, that um, isometric one-legged work, the assisted squat, and any kind of pressing we can get her to do. Uh, and the get and the get back ups. Um, I uh, you can just Google my name and uh, I have a whole bunch on. Uh, I have a workshop I know on Dan John University about um, fitness over a lifetime, and I, and I go to more depth on this. Um, and there is something on I know at Dan John University. I have I I think I have a whole t talk on this. In fact, I might even have a free course for members. Uh, speaking of age related issues uh, that just that was kind of funny to watch me forget what I had on the site um, but what you want to think about is do what you can do and constantly kind of prod ahead okay and don't forget walk 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 gosh I hope that helps okay thank you we have a question from Anthony and Anthony says, I'm a 31 year old and would consider myself a late intermediate to advanced lifter. Best all time numbers are a 545 squat, 635 deadlift and 345 bench. The bench seems low to me, but okay. Being a new father and a first responder has really thrown a wrench into the time I have to devote to training. I'm afraid to lose all my progress on my lifts, which does happen, and some hypertrophy, but still need to train for life, mental, physical health and work. What are your thoughts on focus on calisthenics for a while, and what would that program look like? Well, you know, um, this, there's, there's better people than me for calisthenic uh, advice. Um, up in the shelves back there, I have the Canadian, the Royal Canadian Air Force book, and uh, I know it's online, but why don't you just, I mean, I would just Google calisthenic programs. The Cavaldo brothers have a, a couple of good ones. I think one book is called Get Strong. It's called Get Strong. Uh, oh, maybe it's well, and they have they have some very simple uh, calisthenic stuff. But listen, I mean, if you do proper push-ups, that's where you bring your chest to the ground, 
your hands go to a T, hands come back underneath, you press up. Uh, every variation of the pull-up you can possibly think of, um, you know, uh, what do they, I think they call them prisoner squats. Uh, there's a lot of calisthenic exercises that you might find valuable. Uh, the downside of calisthenics, of course, is the leg work is not, not where it needs to be. But if you just added uh, hill sprints, uh, sprints of all kinds, uh, with the basic calisthenic program, I think you'd be very happy. Um, I don't think you have to go to completely calisthenics, but if that's what you want to do, there's lots of resources online to help you. Oh, that was fast. Um, well, there's episode 113 in the books. Remember, if you have questions, uh, email them to me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'm always ha happy to answer each and every question. Um, today was, I actually liked today's questions a lot. Uh, I thought there was a, um, I thought a couple of the questions were kind of fun and interesting and entertaining. Uh, I'm here to help. Uh, let me know how I can serve you. And until next time, you know, keep on lifting and learning, okay? Bye-bye.